And that name shows up in the Bible. We're talking about war. That's good. Amen. It's a good song. Well, if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Exodus, chapter number 6 with me tonight. Exodus, chapter number 6. Exodus chapter 6 and verse 6. Scripture says, Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, Jehovah, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rid you out of their bondage. I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And I will take you to be to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you in unto the land concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it you for an heritage. I am the Lord. Bless your word now, Father. We need you tonight. Thy name, amen. Now what you have here is quite a remarkable thing. For here's the Lord speaking to his people that are in Egyptian bondage, and they've been there now for 400 years almost. Mo uh, uh, Moses rose up to, to deliver them uh, at the age of 40. He chose and thought that God would be with him at the time had come, but it hadn't. And so he went off into Midian. He stayed another 40 years, and then God spoke to him from a bush that burned and was not consumed and sent him back. And at 80 years of age, Moses comes into the land to deliver the children of Israel from bondage. Moses is one of the unique people in the Bible that his life is broken up into three distinct periods of 40 years. He lived to be 120 years. And so here we have in Exodus chapter number 6, God's promises to Israel. I want you to notice the I wills there. In verses 6, 7, and 8, seven times, God said, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. That's what he does when he saves you. Amen. And then he says, I will rid you out of their bondage. And if you're not born again tonight, you are in bondage. You may not realize it, but you are. He said, I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and great judgments. The judgments are upon the gods of Egypt. Stretched out arm represents the strength, the overcoming power, the absolute sovereignty of God over all the gods of this world. Then he said, I will take you to me for a people. Well, it's one thing to save you, but now the Bible said, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Amen. And then he said, I will be, you, I will be to you a God, and you'll know that I'm the Lord your God. You've got a God tonight. Everybody's got a God. Don't you believe for a minute an atheist doesn't believe in God. Everybody's got a God. Most of the atheists worship their mind. They worship themselves. The agnostic and the world's full of them, they aren't sure. They just don't know for certain. But then I know who my God is tonight, don't you? Amen. I'd hate to be like Rebecca and have my God, uh, you know, carried, carried Laban's God off, and Laban, could, Laban couldn't find his God. Amen. That's, that's an awful God to have, don't you think? Yeah, that's terrible shape. And then, and then if Dagon was your God, it's just about as bad, because you put the Ark of the Covenant in front of Dagon, and who bows before who? <laughs> and so the Bible says, I will bring you in into the land concerning the which I did swear. In plain words, he saved you to fellowship with you, and to walk with you, and do you walk with him? And I've spent two or three weeks now talking about fellowship with God, because if you are walking in the light as he is in the light, you are walking victoriously. I'm not saying you're walking sinless, but you're walking victoriously. And then he says, I will give, I will give it to you for an heritage. Well, of course, we know he's talking about Israel, but the heritage of the Lord is what we have. We have uh, we have for us laid up in heaven, thief nor moth nor anything can touch it. It's ours and it is forever. <laughs> he says, I'm the Lord. Now look at verse 9. And Moses spake unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses. And here's two reasons why. For anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. Do you see how it had dehumanized them? Anytime you put someone into slavery, you dehumanize them. 
You tear them down. You destroy their character and who they are. And this is what happened here. They had been slaves and it had destroyed. And so by doing this, it had put them in a situation where they were hard pressed to believe. They couldn't rejoice, but they were anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. And if you go down the streets now in some of the major cities and see these poor people that are hooked on drugs, you're gonna see anguish of spirit and you're gonna see cruel bondage. And it's a sorry, it's, I mean, it's, it's sad. That's all I can say, sad. A lot of young girls run away from home, 15, 14, 15, 16 years old. They run out of money and they the only thing they have left is their body. And then they go out and sell themselves so that they can, so that they can get their high. You talk about bondage, that's bondage folks. But I want you to notice now, this is what he said I'm gonna do for you. Then in Deuteronomy chapter number 12 and verse number 20, here's how he does it. When the Lord thy God shall enlarge thy border as he hath promised thee, and thou shalt say, I will eat flesh, because thy soul longeth to eat flesh, thou mayest eat flesh whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. The key here is that he is enlarging your borders. This means that once you're born again, you're a babe in Christ, but you need to grow. You need to grow. And, if, uh, and, and part of the growth is that you may be able to eat meat. And meat, of course, represents that one who has matured in the Lord. The Bible, folks, is not a boring book. It's not boring. Believe me, it is not boring. The Bible will, uh, will, will excite your soul if you'll just pray, Lord, open mine eyes that I might behold marvelous things in thy law. Enlargement of the soul always means your enlargement of capacity to receive the things that God would have for you. You remember the Lord said to the disciples, I have many things to say unto you, but you're not ready. You're not ready. You're not ready. So what you have, the Bible, the 66 books of the Bible, is the revelation of God, but not all of it. It's the wisdom of God, but not all of it. It's the knowledge of God, but not all of it. There we only, we, now we see through a glass darkly, but then we're gonna see much, much, much more than we possibly could hear. Let me tell you the worst curse that could come upon you, me, or anyone else. This is a curse beyond belief. What's that? To live forever without God. Amen. Think it through. You talk about a curse. So what do you mean by that? God gives us his life when we leave here. You're not living for some place, some thing. It's God. You're in God. And God gives you a taste and a touch of that eternal being. He's been from everlasting to everlasting. But you think about it for a moment. Just to exist forever. That's hard for us to get a hold of it. I think about it all the time. I think about when you reject the Lord Jesus Christ, you've made an eternal decision. It's eternal. Amen. The consequences are eternal. But then what is eternity? Well, a hundred million, that's nothing. A trillion years from that's nothing. Eternity has no end. That's something that ought to boggle your mind tonight. It ought to really make you think, you're going to be with the Lord forever? And the increase of his kingdom, there is no end? And he that started something in you now will perfect it one day when you're gone from here? Amen. I would not want to live forever without the life of God. And that's what he said in the book of Genesis. He said, lest they take and eat and live forever. So in Deuteronomy chapter number 26 and verse number 18, the Lord hath avouched this day to be his peculiar people as he hath promised thee and that thou shouldest keep all his commandments. What's that mean? Well, that Hebrew word translated avouched is translated, it's, it's in there thousands of times in the Old Testament, and it has a broad range of translations. Best thing to do is find it in context. What did he say? He said, the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his peculiar people. He laid claim to them. That's what happened. He laid claim to them. In Deuteronomy 26 and verse number 17, thou hast avouched the Lord this day to be thy God. And to walk in his way. I lay claim to him. He is mine and I am his. 
That's one of the most beautiful songs that you'll find in that book. He is mine and I am his. He owns me. Amen. He owns me. Amen. I'm his son. He laid claim to me. Now, why would he avouch it? He avouched it publicly. This one's mine. He belongs to me, Satan. And when Satan comes to sift you like wheat, remind him that you belong to the Lord, yeah. Satan. This world is not my home. And the God of this world is not my God. And folks, let me tell you something. You are living in a culture now. And I think most of you understand it by now. You live in a culture that is absolutely saturated with demonic power. It's everywhere you turn, everywhere. If something doesn't happen in America, it won't last much longer. We got people out there that are itching for a civil war. America, they say, is divided right down the middle. Two Americas, and that there is no compromise and no place of agreement to be found anywhere. And you've always got hotheads, warmongers, said, bring it on. We want a war. No, you don't want a war because you don't know anything about war. The only one that has any idea what a war is is one that's been to war. Amen. Then you get an idea of what war is about. No, we don't want a civil war in this country. That's not what we want. But there are those who do. And the reason they do is because they absolutely refuse to live on the conditions of one side or the other. Watch it. It's coming. You've never lived in a time like this before. America will never be the same. Now he's promised them in Joshua 23, verse number 10. He said, one man of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord your God, he it is that fighteth for you as he hath promised you. <laughs> when Joshua stood outside Jericho, the angel of the Lord stood there with a sword sword drawn and he was ready to go fight he's ready to go into combat if we only knew the battle that rages over our soul right now there's a battle going on spiritual warfare and this is why the bible says fight the good fight of faith they take hold of eternal life that's what we're supposed to be doing tonight and if satan can make a casualty out of us then he can use us to tear somebody else down with. And he will do it if, he, if you let him. Because he'd do it to me, he'd do it to you, do it to anybody. One of the biggest lies you ever believed in your life is when you begin to think that you are in, that you're not vulnerable anymore. That you've progressed, that you've matured to the place to where the things that Satan used against you two or three years ago, he can't use against you anymore. Remember this, he changes his tactics. He knows how to come to you. Well, now, when he got them into the land, the Bible said in Romans chapter number one and verse number one, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. This is about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says, for to me to live is Christ. He said, I said, he said, the church at Corinth, I came knowing nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. He said, the preaching of the cross of Christ is foolishness to them that are perishing, that perish. Christ. He took the two on the road to Emmaus, opened the scriptures and showed them Christ. Their hearts burned within them. If the Bible is not saturated with the Lord Jesus Christ, it becomes meaningless. There are many things in the Old Testament that you say to yourself, this absolutely had to belong to a time of ancient, uh, uh, it's hard to find the word. I mean, look at, how many of you remember what David brought back uh, and, uh, from his enemy? And he brought these back and, and, and he was rewarded for it. Uh, you ought to read it sometime. And uh, it'll give you an idea of what goes on. They cut heads off and put them on the ends of staffs. They'd hang them on the walls and the doors. It was, a, it, was a, it was a violent, ancient world that they lived in. And, you know, folks, you've got to keep in mind that the Lord Jesus Christ was revealed from Genesis 
from Genesis through Malachi, but he was not revealed as he was from Matthew through Revelation. And the final revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ is in the book of Revelation. And when you trace the Bible and trace how God reveals his son, you begin to get a hold of what God wants us to know about him here and now. I look for him in the Bible. I look for him in my life. I look for him when I pray. I look for him to give me inspiration. If I didn't have the Lord Jesus Christ tonight, I'd close my Bible, go out the back door and go get me a job somewhere, crawl in a hole and retire. Get me a fishing pole and a, throw a worm out in the water and sit there on the bank for the rest of my life if I didn't have the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you why. Everything that is in ministry, all the parts of the ministry, and I've been at it a long time, it's a thing, it's something. Now it can be a good something and a good thing, but you will get tired of it if you don't have the Lord Jesus Christ feeding your soul, filling you with the Holy Spirit, ministering life to you. And that's where preachers fail sometimes. They fall because of that. They're, 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 when they first start, they're built up with the ministry, the ministry, look how God's using me, the ministry, the ministry. And they're all about numbers, numbers, numbers. But it doesn't take long before they begin to realize how vain all of that really is. You cannot keep going. That's vanity. But you'll never, ever, ever go hungry or thirsty with, with the Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep you going. That's how I made it in here tonight, was the Son of God. He got me here. Amen. Amen. He not only saves me, keeps me, but he gives me direction in life. Now, the Bible said in Hebrews chapter number 12, verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised saying, yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. Well, what did he shake? Well, he shook Sinai, folks. He shook that mountain. He shook the land. He brought fire down upon it. Now, our God is a consuming fire. When he initiated these slaves, to follow him, he began to reveal certain things about him and his nature to them. And so this is a type of something that's going to happen in the future. This is what he's talking about in the book of Hebrews. He says he will once more not only shake the earth, but he'll shake heaven. <laughs> in plain words, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back in Revelation chapter number 19, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. Boy, I'd like to see him come tomorrow. Oh, Lord have mercy. I'd like to see him come tonight. I would. I'd like to see him come as the Lord of hosts. Like you were singing about a moment ago. That's to do battle. And on his, and, and he, and on his thigh he had a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He comes to do battle. Isaiah talks about blood running as high as a horse's bridle. When he comes back to do battle. You say, he's not coming back to bring peace. He'll bring peace, but he'll bring it at the end of the war. <laughs> There'll be peace to the victor. And that peace he'll bring. He brings that physical peace to the earth. But he's already given you tonight of his peace. He says, my peace I give unto thee, not as the world giveth, give I thee. And what peace is that? That's the peace of knowing you're born again. Good night. Have you been watching on the news how these little children are dying all over this country now? These monsters are taking little children. The other day, a family was taken, murdered the whole family. For what? And this is the reason for this, of course, is because they are demon infested, demon possessed. It's everywhere, it's all over the place. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. That's what John said on the Isle of Patmos. Come, Lord Jesus, come. And then finally, it says in James chapter number one, verse number 12, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Now watch this, for when he is tried, it doesn't say if he is tried, it says when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. One of the things that helps us greatly in our Christian walk is to read the testimony of those that have gone on before us, to find out what kind of lives they lived, where they lived, how they suffered, how they endured, and how God blessed them, how he was with them. 
It's an amazing thing when you, when you begin to read about some of these. Here's the thing. We have our heroes. Thank God for all that you've ever heard of. But I'm gonna guarantee, I'll guarantee you tonight, for every one saint, and praise God for them, but for every one you hear about, there's no doubt 10,000 you've never heard about. Their names never made it to the front. They're, they're not, you know, they're not the heroes of faith. And then, like I say again, that's not to put down the names you hear all the time. That's good. But there are thousands of them out there that you've never heard a word about. Well, you will when he sits down at the Bema, at the judgment seat of Christ. And you see all the folks gathered around. You'll say to yourself, my goodness, I knew it was big. Didn't know it was this big. And there they are. And he judges, not for their souls, not for salvation. That judgment was made at Calvary and you accepted it. Think on that. <laughs> but it's not for their souls, it's not for their salvation. It's for their works and rewards. Yes, it's for their rewards, their works. I wonder what kind of reward if, that God would give somebody like me, a preacher, if I'm doing what God called me to do. I'm not hazarding my life right now. But I got a thing the other day from, uh, uh, from uh, Sean uh, Eidelmeyer. Yeah. He, he down in Texas, some of you might have read it, down in Haiti. Yeah. He's talking about it. it's getting bad down there now. It really is. It's really getting bad, real bad. Uh, if I understand it correctly, the worst that it's been in a long time. And he's right smack in the middle of it. He's right down there with it. He's doing, he's doing what God called him to do. He's where God sent him. And I don't know what he plans to do. I haven't been able to communicate. I don't know what his plans are, but I do know this. I think what that young man's doing down there in Haiti is just as important as anything that I've ever done in my 46 years in the ministry. I'm doing what God called me to do. He's doing what God called him to do. That's what matters. You're where God puts you. You're doing what he calls you to do. I'd ask you to do that tonight. Pray for him. He's a fine young man. He is. He's a fine young man. And uh, Haiti is just about ready to explode. Uh, thousands of them are in the streets now. And uh, they've got a lot of gripes. Uh, I understand. I mean, I don't live there, but I if you can't eat and you can't get around and you have nowhere to live and, uh, you know, all the things necessary for life, why, well, it, it'd agitate anybody. See, and this is what's going on. Well, the biggest problem that I can read about Haiti has been for generation after generation after generation. It's been nothing but crooked, corrupt governments that try to run that country. If they get a legitimate government in there, somebody cared for their people, I think it'd make their lives better. Don't you? But he's down there preaching the gospel. He's carrying the word of God. That's my brother. That's my brother. I hold him in just as high esteem as any, any preacher, any name, any, any ministry that I've known in, the, in, the few, in these years. And I've known a few of them. But he's doing what God called him to do. Now, what are you doing? What am I doing tonight? I'm doing what God called me to do. I don't have some special thing. God called me to do this. He called me to. What are you doing? Are you getting the word out? Are you witnessing? Your hand tracks out? You tell people about the Lord. I got a thing the other day from, uh, I forget her name. She sits about halfway back. She said, we're on vacation out here and I'm sitting at a swimming pool. <laughs> and I've got my radio on and it's full blast and I've got you preaching. <laughs> and she, you know, that's, God bless her. I mean, that, that's good. See, everybody's different. A lot of folks are, would, would <laughs> they never do that, you know. But buddy, she loves it. I mean, shaking the windows, <laughs> preaching all. I bet those people down there. <laughs> I bet. They, <laughs> oh Lord, some of them never heard preaching in their life, and all of a sudden, good night. What's this? But have you ever been there? Have you ever seen some of their, uh, some of their? Well, I don't know what you call them, song fest or uh, uh, f festivities and all of that. And they can make racket too, can't they? Yeah, yeah buddy. <laughs> they can make it. Now, it's coming Saturday. Yeah. University of Alabama will be over here on the hill. 
and they've already got every motel room filled up in Knoxville. They're charging some of them 600 bucks a night, and they're telling them that they can't stay just one night. They're going to have to stay three or four nights. And all of that to pack out that stadium and watch two undefeated teams lock horns. Now, I'm not up here to throw off on the ball game. Not at all. Good night. Uh, there's nothing play wrong with playing ball. But I'll guarantee you, guarantee you, within a mile of Nayland Stadium, you'll be able to hear yeah. if a touchdown happens. Yeah. Probably further away than that. Here. Here. Why? Well, they can make noise. That's all right. Make all the noise you want to. Scream, shout, run, jump. Enjoy your ball game. But don't get mad at us if we scream, shout, jump, and run. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for the time we've had together tonight. And we ask you to bless my brother and sister. Maybe I said something to help somebody. God bless all of them, Lord. I'm here to help them. I'm nobody's enemy. I'm here to help them, Lord. I'm trying to tell them what you've done for me, you can do for them. Oh, God. <laughs> How, what, a, what a quick failure I am without you. <laughs> I freely admit it. I go down so fast, it's not funny without you. I ask you in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, I'm done.